This is the rule and reign series, the kingdom of God manifested in our midst. This is one of my favorite subjects in the world to talk about. I love the authority of the believer. I love that when Jesus died, he said it is finished. He meant it was all finished and it's all been restored. And we are who we're supposed to be now in relationship with Christ. The Bible says that we are kings and we are priests as children of God. That's how we rule and reign, as kings and priests, princes and princesses. How many of you would like to rule and reign in life as kings and as priests? How many of you would like that to be just, I mean, how does a king carry himself? Think about that. When you're the king, how do you carry yourself? How many of you would like to rule like that? Have that level of confidence and authority. When you say something, in your kingdom it gets done. Hello? When you decree something, in your kingdom it gets done. I'm going to teach you something today that if it sinks in, if you actually take it to your heart, it'll change the trajectory of your life. That's a pretty big, bold claim, isn't it, Jimmy? Watch and see. Watch and see. The first question I'm going to ask you guys, the name of the message is where it all begins. Where it all begins, for those of you who are taking notes. Who or what has the authority to speak into your life? And I'm asking specifically, who have you given that authority to? Who or what have you yielded authority to to speak into your life? What external voices have the authority to challenge you or confront you? Some folks don't let nobody tell them nothing. And it shows. And it shows. In order to walk in authority, my personal belief, and I believe that I could back it up biblically, as one who walks in authority, you have to first learn and be able to submit to authority. At the very least, we all submit to the authority of God. Then he puts leaders in our lives, jobs, pastors, lay ministers, friends, who also have the potential to be able to speak into our lives. And I'm going to tell you something, that a leader, their job is not just to instruct you in what you want to hear. Somebody who is a leader in your life needs to be able to instruct you in what you need to hear. And some folks can't handle that because what we want to hear and what we need to hear are not always the same thing. If you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. And if you've ever had a parent, you know what I'm talking about. How many of you had a dad that told you something when you were 15 years old that when you were 25 years old, you wished you'd listened to? (laughs) If your hand ain't going up, you're who I'm talking to today. (laughs) In ministry, my job as a pastor, as a teacher, is to challenge you and to equip you with proper spiritual perspective. That's my job. My job is not to get up here and make you feel good. My job is not, gonna, is not to tell you things that make your, make your ears tickle and what you want to hear. My job is to tell you what I feel like the Holy Spirit has instructed me to share with you throughout the week. Sometimes the thing I'm sharing with you on Sunday is just what I learned on Wednesday. But I believe that God is using circumstances to teach you today. So here's the thing. We're going to start with Ephesians chapter 4, and this is not a, this is not going to be on the screen. This came afterwards as I was studying, and I just want to share what the Bible says about leadership. It says that God has, has appointed some with the grace to be apostles and prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. In verse 12, it says, and their calling is to nurture and prepare all the holy believers to do their own works of the ministry. And then verse 13 says, and then our immaturity will end. And I'll just leave it right there. That's what, the, that's what the five-fold ministry is supposed to do. It's to equip the saints with the information necessary for them to do the ministry that they know how to do. So I actually hadn't even made that connection of that scripture whenever I told you guys to lay hands on each other. I just felt to do that in that moment. But you can see 
that that actually is part of what is the instruction that God's sharing here and in, in, uh, that, that's being shared here in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And as kings and priests, every one of us are leaders in our own rights. We're leaders over our families. We're leaders in our jobs and our relationships. We're spiritual leaders within our spheres of influence. And great leaders challenge you to think beyond what you already know. Right? So in Matthew 6, 33, when the Bible says, but first and most importantly... I take notice. As a spiritual leader, I take notice. Because it says first and most importantly. That must mean a pretty important thing is about to be said. Seek, aim at, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, the attitude and the character of God. And all these things will be given to you. In context, it's talking about that we concern ourselves with so many other things. But God says if you'll just seek first his way of doing and being, everything else will be added to you. And the reason that, and, and how we know what God's way of doing and being is, that's what the kingdom of God is talking about. It's not talking about heaven. Seek first heaven, no. It's not talking about, when you get saved, you're going to heaven. When he talks about seeking first the kingdom of God, he's talking about uh, the, God's way of doing and being, who God wants you to be as a king and a priest, as his representative. Ruling and reigning is what we're called to do. But whether or not we do it is contingent upon how we respond to God and his word because God and his word are the instruction manual for how to rule and reign in this life. Point one. God's word is the foundational lens that we process all other information through. If it's not then we're not seeking first his kingdom. If we're seeking first his kingdom, first and foremost, then his word is the lens that we we weigh all information through. I can remember several years ago, uh, Lisa and I were just married. I'm going to give several examples that involve my wife and I, and all of them are respectful, honey. Several years ago, we were first married, and, you know, I was raised up in the faith movement, was actually raised Catholic and hadn't been taught a lot about faith and the, the, you know, the principles of faith until she met me. And we were engaged, we were uh, together for a couple of years, two and a half years before we got married. So she hadn't had a long history of faith teaching like I had had. And we got married and we bought a new truck because both of our vehicles were completely jacked up and we needed something that was reliable. And I'm uh, driving down the street one day, and she calls me on my cell phone. I can remember right where I was at when she called. And she tells me that it didn't, we weren't going to have enough money in the bank for our bills that month. And I kind of nonchalantly was like, okay. And she got mad. Why in the world don't you care? I said, Lisa, it's not that I don't care. I, this concerns me too. But what can I do? I'm working all the time, we give, we pay our tithes, which these are the prerequisites. Didn't we just read in Malachi a few minutes ago when we received our offering that when we bring our tithes into the storehouse, that he pours out blessing that we don't have room enough to contain. I said, we do all these things, I don't know what to tell you. If it's not there, it's not there. She gets mad, we hang up. I literally look out the window and I say, God, you're going to have to show her. This is not something I can teach her. Immediately, a friend of mine who lived right next door called me and he said, hey, Aaron, I don't have enough money to buy a truck, but I know you just bought a new truck. I said, yeah, I did. He said, God told me to sow seed into your truck. How much is the payment this month? This is immediately after the conversation and me saying, God, what am I going to do? We got a teacher. I I come home, I walk in the door and I said, our truck payment's paid. And she said, what? I said, I told you God's faithful. God is always faithful. Now, that was a great learning lesson for Lisa. Great learning lesson for all of us. A great learning lesson for me. God is faithful. Because I know that the word of God is true in spite of circumstances, I can exhibit faith. I stand upon the word of God in circumstances like that. When situations come that don't make sense, I go to the word of God. Lisa now goes to the word of God. She's seen it time and time again. And as we test him in this, 
when it comes to the financial things, we see that he pours out blessing and that he's faithful to do what he said. There's always voices speaking into our lives. And I'm going to ask you a question. Who in the world are you listening to? See what I did there? Flip those words around. Who in the world are you listening to? Whose voice is taking the place of God's voice in your life? When you're listening to the world and getting your input and your cues from the world, you have to realize who the God of this age is, who, the, who they're listening to. Who are they taking their cues from? If not the Holy Spirit, if not the Word of God, where are your mentors who don't know the Spirit of God, where are they getting their information from? So when you're receiving input that's contrary to the Word of God and you're listening to the world's perspectives, you are getting input or cues, taking your cues from the God of this age and not the God of covenant. And that can lead to destruction. As believers, we must prioritize the promises of God above every other voice. His word must be the primary lens that we receive all information through. We have to. If we don't, we will find ourselves being led by a spirit and a voice that is contrary to our covenant. Tell me all right there. Maybe just listen. Psalms 49, verses 5 through 7 say this. There's no reason to fear. I read this this week, and it stood out to me. There's no reason to fear when troubling times come. Even when you're surrounded with problems and persecutors who chase your heels. Then it goes and talks about the world and how the world processes stuff. They trust in their treasures and boast in their riches. Yet not one of them, though rich as a king, could rescue his own brother from the guilt of his sins. Or in other words, look, man, you're looking to all the wrong things. You don't have to be afraid because you have a covenant and a relationship with the Most High God. You don't have any reason to fear it. They have to fear because they trust in their riches. But I'm the Lord God Almighty. I'm above all that. Trust in the Lord. Point two, faith responds to his word. Faith responds to his word. We all say that we have faith in God, but I'm going to tell you something. Real faith demands action. Real faith doesn't say, yeah, I believe. Real faith acts on what they believe. You don't have to tell me what you believe. You don't have to tell me what you think. I know because your actions reveal your belief system. But James 2 says that faith without works or actions to back it up is dead. Another version actually says faith without works is phony. Faith without action is phony. It's fake. And then he goes on to say, I will show you my faith by my works. I'll show you my faith faith by how I respond to circumstances and how I weigh it through the lens of what I know. Instruction from God's word comes in two ways. There's two different forms of word. There's the logos and there's the rhema. <clears throat> For those of you who haven't been taught this before, the logos is the written word of God. The rhema is the imparted word of God or the spoken word of God or the word of God that comes in a moment when somebody is either prophetically uttering something or God is moving on you and speaking to your spirit. That's called the rhema word of God. The logos is the written word of God. Several years ago, my wife, Lisa, actually about a year and a half or two years, I think, after we had the conversation about the truck, says to me, she says, Aaron, the Bible says to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. So let me ask you a question. If we're paying our tithe on our net instead of our gross, is that the whole tithe? And I said, I don't know. She goes, is the government getting theirs before God's getting his? I said, yeah. She says, I think we need to be paying on our gross. I said, I agree. She did that. She implemented that. She's handled the bills. She's much better at that than I am. A week or two later, she gets a promotion on her job. 300% raise and a vehicle. 
They asked her, what vehicle do you want? She said, I'll take that one right there in the showroom. Convertible. Convertible Camaro. I'm driving a convertible Camaro a couple generations later today. It was the implementation of the word of God in faith that I believe actually opened the door. I actually believe that God laid that on her heart because he was planning to bless, but he needed something to work with. He needed a seed to produce in our lives because if you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always got. But I believe that it was the heart of God to actually move on our behalf. So he moved on my wife to consider the extra so that God could do the extra in our lives. Faith. It's the implementation of faith. The rhema word of God. That was the logos, the Bible says. The rhema word of God. A few years ago, I'm sitting in a cigar shop with a friend of mine who's special ops, and he looks at my watch. Now listen, I'm going to tell you something. I don't buy anything without going, if it doesn't jump out at me, I don't buy it. Like, I don't just, I don't go looking for a watch. I go to a department store to buy a pair of pants and the watch yells at me as I walk by. Aaron, look at me. Oh, look at that. I got to have that. And that's what happened with the watch. I bought that watch because it screamed at me. Hey, boy. I bought that watch, and I liked it. I'm the kind of guy that wears the same watch for years because it works, and I like it. I'm sitting at... The cigar shop with my buddy, Special Ops, his name's Aaron as well. And he goes, man, I really like that watch. That is really, really cool. And I heard him say, give him your watch. And I said, but Jesus, I like that watch. And he said, I didn't ask you if you liked the watch. And I said, but Jesus, that's my watch. And he said, I have this bigger teddy bear for you if you will just let go of it. So I took my watch off. I took it off. I took it off. I took off that watch. I took my watch off and I handed it to him and he was looking at it and I said, try it on because if your wrist is too big, I'm going to thank Jesus. <laughs> he tried it on. and He goes, man, it looks really good. I said, it's yours. He said, no, no, man, no. I, I, I can't take your watch. And I said, no, man, you need to take it because I really feel like God wants me to give it to you. Interesting story. Because I modeled that to him, that was where it ended up happening in his life as well. He ended up giving it to some kid who worked at McDonald's who admired it on his wrist. But I went home, and Lisa goes, after a couple of days, she goes, where was your watch? And I said, I gave it away. And she said, oh, I'll buy you a new one for Christmas. I said, no, you won't. We're not spending money on another watch. I gave that watch away. God is going to give me a new watch, or I will be watchless. And a... About a month later, I walked into the same cigar shop. Don't tell me God doesn't use cigar shops. I walked into the same cigar shop, and I'm sitting down, and my, my buddy Greg, oh, I wasn't going to say his name, crap. My buddy walked into the cigar shop, and he says, and he, and he, he walks in, and I see his watch when he walks in. He walks in, and he sits down, and I go, man, that's a nice watch. He takes off the watch, and he goes, man, I bought this new watch today. Now, let me tell you about this watch. I was at the jewelry store. Remember how I told you? Hey! I was at the jewelry store, and I saw a stand-up, six-foot stand-up of a watch six or eight months ago before this event. And I look at the watch, and I, it stops in my tracks, and I go, Oh, that's nice. I walk into the jewelry store. Can I see that watch right there? But what I really meant to say was, how much is that watch? But I didn't want to seem like I was too concerned about that. And they hand me the watch, and I go, man, that's a pretty watch. And I look at the price tag, and I go, that's a really pretty watch. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for showing that to me. Way out of my league price-wise. Way out of my league. Wasn't going to be able to spend that kind of money on it. Sitting in the cigar shop, and my buddy hands me the watch, and as he's handing it to me to show it to me, because he just bought it, still had the box in the car, 
as he hands me the watch, his face goes. Did you catch that? That was a. And I said, man, dude, that's beautiful. And I go to hand it back to him. He said, you bought that watch. And I said, yeah. He goes, the Holy Spirit says it's yours. He said, I bought it for you. And I said, thank you, Holy Spirit. I put the watch on. Now, here's the thing. It had been six months since I'd seen the poster. I forgot about it. But I walked back past that evening or maybe the evening after. I walked back past that poster. And I look at the poster that I, that I saw six months before, and it's the watch on my wrist. God pays attention to the small things. He's got the thing that he wants to give you, but it takes an action of faith many times to see the hand of God move. From what I've seen in the world, it's not typically need that moves the hand of God, it's faith. Not typically need. Now, sometimes God ministers to need, but most of the time that I've seen, I can't think of a single instance when it doesn't have faith attached to it. There's always somebody instituting faith somewhere in order for the hand of God to move in our midst. An actionable faith, I believe, is the catalyst for breakthrough in every area of life. Matthew 7 and and Luke 11 both instruct, ask and keep on asking and you'll receive. It doesn't just say, if you've got a need, you'll receive. It says, ask and keep on asking and you'll receive. Seek and keep on seeking and you'll find. Knock and keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. So it's not just about the need. It's about the action or what we do when we need. We ask and we keep on asking and we place our petitions before the Lord and we receive. There was an action in faith. Faith is displayed with action. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says this. Without faith, Living within us, it would be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith, say in faith, knowing. We come to God in faith, knowing that he is real and that he rewards the faith of those who passionately seek him. Proverbs 5, or 3, 5, and 6 say, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Say all. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, say all. There's something about all that matters right here. It's used twice. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your paths straight. Both of these scriptures reveal that when we do things in faith, the hand of God moves on our behalf. James 1, 6 through 8 says this. Just make sure you are empowered. You you ask empowered by confident faith without doubting that you will receive for the ambivalent person believes one minute and doubts the next being undecided makes you come like the rough seas driven and tossed by the wind you're up one minute and tossed down the next when you're half-hearted and wavering it leaves you unstable can you really expect to receive anything from the lord when you're in that condition or in other words when you ask Put your faith in God and give it to him. Don't ask half-heartedly. Don't give it to him and hold on to it and not let go. Don't try to control. Sorry, I just spit on the front row. Don't try to control what you've given to God. Trust that his word is true and then stand upon it. What you believe, you'll act out. You know, Lisa and I, over the years, have given away multiple cars, multiple motorcycles, a lot of stuff. I've given away a lot of stuff. But I looked at every, and sometimes I couldn't afford to. Like, when we gave away our cars, we needed the money to sell them. But we gave them away. Because I know that the return on that investment would be far more than the money I would get by keeping it or selling it. We sow it into somebody's life who's in need, and then God multiplies it. A few years ago, I was needing a car. Now, when the new Camaros came out, how many of you remember when the body style changed to the Generation 5 Camaro? Actually, it was probably highlighted by the Bumblebee Camaro in Transformers. How many of you remember that? I love that body design. Loved it. And so I would drive down the road, and I would go, oh, God, I like that black Camaro. Ooh, I love those red brake calipers. 
yeah, that's sharp, God. That's, that's what I want. I love that. Now, mind you, I'm dreaming. I'm visualizing because I've put seed in the ground and I've met somebody else's need. I couldn't afford to buy that car. Lisa calls me. She's working for a car dealership. She says, we just got a car here that is, it's you. Like I saw it and it just looks like you. It came in on trade. Will you come and look at it? And I was like, baby, we can't afford a car. She said, just come look at it. I pull up and I had never seen a flat black Camaro before. Never. I didn't even know that I would like a flat black Camaro better than a shiny black Camaro until I saw it. Red brake calipers, just like I said I liked, but it was bad. It was bad. She goes, take it for a ride. And I went, okay. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy. I'm not going to not take advantage of driving that thing around for a little while. Check it out. Take it for a drive. And I come back up, and I was like, it's nice. I really like it. She goes, you want it? I said, baby, I already told you. We can't afford it. This is great to like for me to... In my mind, I'm thinking, this is great for me to, like, put my faith towards. Now I know something else that I can tell Jesus that I like about it. You know, now I like a flat black Camaro, not just a regular black one. I said, no, I, we can't afford it. And I go to give her the keys back, and she said, somebody bought that Camaro for you today. I said, what? She said, it's paid for. They bought it for you. They want you to have it. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah, give the Lord a hand. I drove that car for a few years, then I upgraded to the Gen 5 with the V8 Corvette engine in it, or the Gen 6, and guess what? That one was given to me too. What's, what am I saying here, guys? What I'm telling you is God is faithful. You see those reflexes, Jimmy? I caught that thing when it popped. It was a lolly. It popped out of my mouth. Did I use that word right? Lolly? Lisa, she always tells me, don't chew on those things while you're preaching. I can't help it. If I don't, I'll be drinking all the time. Water. Water. <clears throat> God is faithful, guys. He honors the seed. Now, it took years of seed in the ground before it produced those, those Camaros. But God gave them to me. In times when I couldn't afford them. The reason I'm sharing this with you is I know the word of God is true because I've seen it. I've seen his promises manifested in my life. I am not special. I'm just willing to put seed in the ground. And the promises of God are yes and amen. The Bible says that where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. And here's the deal. I've been watching COVID stuff. I've seen the way that, 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 that the church has responded to COVID. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm with you. Like, there's a reason to be cautious. I get it. But this hoarder's mentality, this rushing to get toilet paper and buy 79 rolls, it's rooted in fear. It's rooted in selfishness. It's, it's rooted in the world's way of thinking. You understand what I'm saying? Remember when I told you about the God of this age and how when you're taking advice and you're cues from people who are, who are led by the spirit of the world and not the spirit of God? That's what the world does. We're supposed to operate above that. We're supposed to be functioning in a, in a way that when, when, when situations come, as, as it said in the Psalms that we read a few minutes ago, when the situations come, we don't fear the circumstances because we trust in the Lord. Men trust in their riches. The world trusts in their riches. The God of this age tells us to trust in our riches. We trust in God. We put our faith in the word of the Lord. And the Bible says that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. The reason I'm sharing financial, this is not a message on giving. I mean, it is, but it's not. It's a message on the word of God being the lens that we do everything through. It's about faith. It's about responding in faith regardless. It's about praying for, for the sick and believing that they're going to recover. It's about putting a seed in the ground when we can't afford to. You know, that when Jesus, one of the, the few times that Jesus acknowledged anybody's giving, it was the least offering that probably was ever given in biblical account. It was called the widow's might. It was less than a penny. It was worth less than a penny. But Jesus acknowledged her and said she gave more than anybody because it was all she had. 
Jesus pointed that out because it's not about the amount. It's not like, well, my amount, what I give isn't going to make that big of a difference to the kingdom. No, but it'll make a difference to you. God's not asking for something just because he wants to take from you. He's got that bigger thing behind him that he's wanting to give. Many people have zero issue doing what God has asked them to do until it costs them something. And I want to ask you a question. What does that read? Because anything worth having is going to cost you. Anything worth experiencing is going to have a fight attached to it. Anything worth your destiny and proving your future is going to come with an enemy trying to keep you from accomplishing it. What the Word of God, I believe what the Spirit of God, the rhema Word of God is saying to you today, He's speaking to your heart, and He's just using some bald-headed, tattooed, freaky fella to convey it. But I believe that the Spirit of God is saying to you today is to put your faith in His Word and not in everything else that you see going on in your world. Have you been cutting in and out? Did y'all catch that? Because I'm going to say it one more time as best as I can remember. He's saying, put your faith. And try what, the, what he's saying is, put your faith into action. Faith in your finances. Faith in the way that you live. Faith in the promises of his. You don't understand that the Bible says that the promises of God are yes and amen. And what that means is, the promises, his answers to his promises are yes. But it takes us agreeing and saying amen with them in order to bring them about in our lives. And those actions, actionable faith, is what actually is us speaking. Our actions declare our amen. Sometimes we say amen with our mouth and we don't do it with our heart. That's why James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. You tell me you've got faith, I'm gonna show you I've got faith and you're gonna see it by the way that I respond. The way that we respond, I believe that Finances show us more than anything else where our faith is. The Bible says where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And checkbooks tell us what we prioritize. If you're going to rule and reign in life, God needs to be Lord of all your life. And that includes your finances. I'm actually convinced that ruling and reigning begins, it begins with the submission to God's word in your finances. Because I believe that that's the one area that most people have the greatest difficulty giving God lordship. I believe it starts there. Because if, you, if God knows he's got your heart with your money, he can have your heart in anything else. I know that. Luke 16 10 says this and we'll close with this scripture whoever can be trusted with very little whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much and whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much if you close the lilies of the valley if he cares for the birds and the sparrows how much more do you think he cares about you child of God king of priest created in his image co-joint heir with Christ how much more do you think he cares about you so we don't worry about those other things we trust in the Lord with all our hearts and we lean not on our own understandings and we acknowledge him in every way and he directs and makes our paths straight guys God is faithful God is faithful you're sitting in this place today and you're saying, let's all stand. If you're standing in this place today and you're saying, Pastor Aaron, I have strayed from God. I'm not talking about giving. Do you, please understand, giving is the example that holds very clear analogy in this scenario, but I'm talking about actually our faith and belief in God. 
And if you've been in a season where you've been more influenced by the spirit of fear than the spirit of faith, <laughs> if you've been more influenced by what the world's saying than by what your Bible says, if you've been more influenced by circumstances and situations instead of the promises of God, I'm asking you to take account of those things and to lay them at Jesus' feet because it's time to start walking in faith as and reign, rule and reign as kings and priests in this world because that is what the enemy is trying to keep you from becoming because that is your destiny. If you're in this place and you're saying, Pastor Aaron, it's time for me to lay those things at God's feet and walk in faith, whether you have never accepted Christ as your Lord and you're ready to start today or you're in this place and you're saying, Pastor Aaron, I'm ready right now to start walking in a new level of faith. I want to see those hands go up all over the place, all over the place. If you are praying that prayer for the first time, I'm going to pray for you, and I just want you to agree with this prayer. Say in your heart, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I want a new life in you. Make me new and mold me into who you want me to be. In Jesus' name. If you just prayed that prayer, you've received Christ for the first time or you've rededicated your life, there's a little card in the back of the seat in front of you. It says, I have decided to follow Jesus. If that's you today, you decided to follow Jesus, I'd, I'd appreciate it if you take just a moment and fill out that card. It's in the seat back in front of you. And as you leave today, you'll see a fellow right back there by the yes desk. His name is Rod. Rod is my buddy. and. Uh, you can just give that to him, and somebody will follow up with you this week. Additionally, if you're a first-time guest today, you haven't had the opportunity yet to fill out one of these connection cards, I would like to reach out to you, or one of our pastoral staff would like to reach out to you and just welcome you. Figure out why it is that God sent you here and how we can help you to connect, because I believe if you are here, you are here on purpose. So if you'd like to speak with one of our pastors and just get to know us a little bit better and allow us to get to know you better, if you'd fill out one of those connection cards, we would love to be able to connect with you. And you can also give that to Rod on your way out. Did y'all get anything out of this today? God's faithful. God's faithful. God's faithful. Amen. But we are going to as we do every week, we are going to worship together and praise together one more time, and then our worship team will dismiss us, but we believe in going out with a shout, and so we're going to allow, who's, who's leading this one? Victoria, to lead us out in praise today, amen?